we need to step back a little bit and um, give a little bit of a background as to um, the residential school process in Canada. Um, it all started around the 1820s. Uh, they set up a residential school in, uh, for, for Ojibwe's and Mohawks in the 1820s. And the residential school process, uh, it, it, uh, it invited the students to come into a place where they, they were administered by, mostly at the time, it was the church and partly by a Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, it was the Upper Canada at the time in Ontario. And the education process involved uh, science, um, English, math, and grammar. And uh, it turned out that the education process was, was a lot uh, better. It was much improved. Uh, it was a much improved system. Uh, than, than, than the education that was being provided to non-Aboriginal people in Ontario. And it came to a point where uh, these non-Aboriginal people were complaining that the Aboriginal people were getting better educated than, than they were. So by 1850, the, the uh, residential school system had run for 30 years and, and it it didn't have any kind of um, background and history of mistreatment or abuse or anything like that. And, and then it stopped. It didn't really uh, recommence until the 1880s when the Federal Department of Indian Affairs, along with the Catholic Church of Roman Catholic Church and the Anglican Church and other churches, uh, stepped up and, and uh, uh, agreed to provide education for Aboriginal children in Canada. And this was in the 1880s. Here in the Maritimes, uh, in the 1880s, they started what they call the Indian Day School system on the reserves. But it was not available and it was not uh, equitable or equally provided for to, in all the Indian communities in, in, in the Maritimes. Some communities had, had the school system and some communities didn't have any school. Most of the larger reserves had a school built and they had sisters and nuns and priests uh, teaching in those school systems. I, I started uh, in, in an in Indian day school system when I was um, six years old in 1955 in Big Cove. Uh, I'm not too far behind you, Clark. <laughs> and and uh, so we had an almost similar situation with the exception of, of staying and, and being boarded in, in, in the school in the Indian day system. But we were strapped for speaking our language we were strapped for laughing or joking. I was, I was strapped every time I started using my, my, right, my left hand because I was left-handed. And I got the ruler across my hand every time I started writing on the, on the, with a chalk on the blackboard with my left hand or even on, in, at my desk and holding a pencil with my left hand. Uh, they couldn't, they couldn't break me from using my, my left hand. Uh, so the, the uh, residential school system, Shubanakari, started, they built the school in 1926, and finally 1929 and opened it in 1929. I had, a, in my community, I had an aunt, uh, two aunts, Martha and Barbara, who uh, asked if they could go to residential school because their two boyfriends, uh, 
John Augustine and Sam Augustine from Big Cove were sent to residential school, so they wanted to follow them to school. And they asked their parents if they could go to residential school, and my grandparents said, sure, if you want to go, go. And they went. One of them was eight years old, and the other one was 10 years old, and, and, and they stayed there until they were 16. But when, the shock that they arrived at in Shubanakati was the boys and the girls were separated. They didn't see each other until Sunday at Mass, and even at that, separated uh, girls in one side and boys on, on the other side, and they could never speak to one another. Uh, if they did, they were, they were beaten, like, like Clark was. They were always punished for speaking their language or doing something wrong, and, and it was always the, the ruler or the strap. It's like a harness, the material that's used to strap a, the saddle onto a horse, and big, wide, uh, solidly knit together, and, and uh, that was used to hit on the hands, on the back, on the buttocks. And uh, so they used that uh, to teach us in, in Indian day school. And uh, the same thing, my aunts, two aunts, when they came and left the residential school, they, they started in 1934, and they got out uh, sometime in the war period. I know one of the aunts went to United States. They went to Boston. And one of them worked as a riveter on uh, building uh, ships. Uh, and they, she had to leave uh, her work because uh, of the metal that she was inhaling. In, and she eventually died of cancer, lung cancer. Uh, she had two daughters. and. Uh, she had the same problem of not being able to love her children or embrace them and say, I love you. Uh, my other aunt, Barbara, uh, from Elsie Bukduk, also had children, and she was uh, never able to, to embrace them and love them in the way that my mother loved us, our, her kids. We had nine in our family, and some of our aunts were really... They, they, they didn't go to residential school, but particularly them, and especially Augustine and, and Sam Augustine, their kids all grew up uh, uh, not, not being able to have the love from, from their parents. And this is what the, the residential school uh, process instilled in our people. They, they took the, the knowledge systems that our people had or the relationships that they could have had with their grandparents, like Clark was talking about his grandfather going in the woods to do the ceremonies. My great-grandfather also did the same thing. Grandfather, he, his, his ceremonial pipe was taken away from him in Moncton for doing a celebration, uh, for lighting the pipe and smoking it with his four sons. and. Uh, he had spent time in jail for it. And so all of that, all of that connection to the land, our relationship with the land was taken away from us. And, and so our people had to suffer. So from 1929 until 19, I think it was 79, when uh, Shubanakati School finally officially closed, um, that's when... Uh, the residential school system stopped, but the effects of that continue to live on even to this day. We heard Clark Paul talking about his own personal story about being in Shubanakati Residential School and uh, uh, having no way or no opportunity to escape what he was being put through. He went to the priest, he told the police, and they're the ones that brought him back and put him back in the same spot where, where he was, where he was abused. And, and you can imagine the number of children over those many years from 1929, 50 years after
and in some places across Canada from, 19, from 1881 till 1970s, 1982, the last one closing, 1996, the last one closing. Um, so it, it, it has been a har har harrowing experience for at least about 120,000 children that were taken away and, and taken from their families, their, from their communities. And then, and then when it was over, when they went back to their communities, they couldn't speak their language. They couldn't communicate with their grandparents. They ended up being ostracized from their own communities and they ended up in, in, the, in the cities, in the towns. And where do you go as a poor Indian in the towns and the cities? You end up with all the other poor people in the ghettos and in the, the, the worst parts of the towns and the cities. And this is where a lot of our own people ended up in, across Canada in those towns and cities. They became disconnected from their people, from their families. They came disconnected from the land that, that protected them, that provided their, their whole livelihood. The animals, the birds, plants and fish, they were able to rely on them for, for all of the things that they needed to survive and to exist. They didn't need government to give them money to, to, to survive. Our people survived really well for over 10, 11, 12,000 years in North America before European peoples arrived. And it was after the arrival, colonization, and, and, and the use of the residential school system to, to help assimilate our people and make them become uh, bright Canadian citizens, to assimilate them into Canadian society. They would become no longer Indians. <coughs> and uh, even a step further, uh, in 1969 with the white paper policy, the, the federal government of Canada wanted to do away with Indians by uh, taking away the Indian Act, the act that recognized us as distinct, uh, distinctly identified indigenous peoples of North America with aboriginal rights to our land, to be able to rely on the land for our survival and our existence. And they took all of that away and put us into reservations. And they took our livelihood away and they told us that we would be trespassing if we went off the reserve. We needed uh, permission from the Indian agent to walk outside of the reserves. So there was no way for us to, to earn a livelihood uh, to be able to go to the river and to the forest and to, to the land to where our, our economies and our culture and our traditions and our languages were supported. Everything we talk about in our language was describing the land, describing the water, describing the animals, the birds, the plants, and the fish, and everything that we derive from it. Our language spoke of that. It spoke of the weather, the conditions of water, the winds, the stars, the weather. So, all of that was taken away from the Indians and they were placed on the reserves. We didn't have our own economy and we had no, we could not say we don't want that. We could not vote to say we don't vote against, we, we, we're going to vote against what's happening to us. Indian people in Canada were not recognized as citizens, not until 1960, 61, 62 after the Bill of Rights that was introduced by the Diefenbaker government in 1958 in the Supreme Court of Canada with the case called the Dry Bones case where it involved an Indian in Northwest Territories being drunk and, and at a hotel and he was charged. And a non-native young person who just graduated from law school took on the case and, and fought it all the way to the Supreme Court, that it was against human rights in Canada to treat Indians differently. And 
only then and after then when the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that the Indians had human rights as well as any Canadian, they were only became, became recognized as Canadian citizens after 1961-62. And only then the Indians could they could go into a liquor store and buy alcohol. Uh, it was only after 1960-61-62, after the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that the Indians were Canadian citizens and had rights as Canadian citizens under the Canadian Bill of Rights. So now, today, after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, after the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, after the Hawthorne reports looking into the conditions of Indian reserves in Canada, the Hawthorne reports were done in, in, in Harry B. Hawthorne was a sociologist, a professor at University of British Columbia, and he did successfully ex examine and did research on the conditions of Indians in British Columbia. He was given a contract to study conditions across Canada in 1964 and 65, and he published two, two reports in 1966 and 67. And Soon after that, the white paper policy came into place, but it was repealed uh, at the House of Commons because Canadian citizens lobbied on behalf of Aboriginal or Indian people in Canada. Major newspapers, the Globe and Mail, the Montreal Gazette, the CBC, they lobbied on behalf of Aboriginal peoples in Canada and they were able to convince the parliament to rescind the white paper policy in 1969. So they did away with the idea of doing away with Indians with just a stroke of a pen. And now we, we, we are uh, bouncing back, like Clark has been saying. Uh, we are bouncing back. We are on, in the process of, of I was going to say repatriation, reconciliation, but I could say probably more likely than repatriation or repatriating ourselves to, to our culture and our traditions and reconnecting with our relationships to the lands that provided our support for thousands of years. And uh, I just wanted to go back and, and, and preface everything I uh, was talking about and what he was subjected to as, as, a, as a, an, an Indian, as a child, as a person being sent to the Indian residential school, and, and, and the idea that you couldn't escape that. These you went to for, to help, they took you back, they brought you back and, and subjected you to, to that. So, this is the situation for indigenous people in Canada. And the, the reconciliation has to happen because we have to all acknowledge as citizens what's happened in our collective history in the past. You're, you're, you're not implicated as much today as modern Canadian citizens, but somehow our ancestors had experienced that in our history acknowledge that and say, yes, I am, we are, we are sorry, we, we apologize, and, and we ask for, for uh, somehow to rebuild ourselves, to rebuild the dignity and the honor and the respect. Oh my, <laughs> that, that, that we deserve. 